Hello and welcome to Sleep 101. My name is Dr. Adam Heenan and today I'll be discussing how poor sleep affects cardiac patients and what you can do to improve your sleep. Insomnia is defined by healthcare professionals as a chronic sleep problem that includes the following. People with insomnia have difficulty falling asleep, staying asleep, and or waking up too early and not being able to fall back asleep. People with insomnia feel fatigued all day and without energy. They feel more stressed and irritable. And to qualify as clinical insomnia, these problems have to last at least three months or longer. How common is insomnia? At least 25% of adults in the general population are dissatisfied with their sleep. However, percentage of adults who actually meet criteria for insomnia is about 10%. In cardiac patients, this percentage is three to four times higher, ranging from 30 to 40%. For example, one study of people who had experienced a recent heart attack found that 37% had clinical insomnia. At the Heart Institute, we take insomnia very seriously for several reasons. For example, insomnia is a risk factor for developing cardiovascular disease, and it's linked with other cardiovascular risk factors, such as hypertension or dyslipidemia. Furthermore, insomnia puts people with cardiovascular disease at greater risk of having future heart problems. But the good news is, there is effective treatment for insomnia, and we will discuss what you can do to improve your sleep in this video. Normally, insomnia starts to take hold after poor sleeping habits are developed in response to something that disrupts your sleep. There are several risk factors for developing insomnia. Gender is one risk factor. Women are more at risk for developing insomnia because of both hormonal changes as well as menopause. Stress is another thing that keeps people up at night, as it's difficult to fall asleep when our minds won't turn off. Emotional health problems, such as depression, can lead to insomnia. Medical problems can make it hard to sleep, especially things like chronic pain or migraines, and our sleep can also be affected by the medications that we take to treat our health problems. Traveling across time zones or shift work can mess up our sleep schedules and lead to insomnia. And finally, age. Older people are at higher risk for developing insomnia because they're more likely to experience stress, emotional health concerns, and aches and pains. Normally, people fall asleep within 30 minutes or less, and sleep between 6 and 9 hours per night. Everyone is different in terms of how much sleep that they need to feel good the next day, and as we age, we sleep less, which means that the 8-hour rule might not apply to you. It is normal to awaken often throughout the night, whether it is to use the washroom or just to roll over and get more comfortable. Either way, the amount of time that you should spend awake throughout the night is normally less than 30 minutes. When we don't get enough sleep, there are consequences for our mind and body. We typically have poor memory, learning, and judgment. We have less energy and are more at risk of accidents, whether that be in a car or simply bumping into a table and falling down. There are other physical effects on our body, such as high blood pressure, and also weight gain. We tend to put on weight when we don't get enough sleep. This happens because sleep deprivation causes our metabolism to slow down, telling our body to store energy and crave more sugar. Being tired and carb hungry leads us to make poor food choices and to exercise less. Basic sleep hygiene refers to general tips about sleep. Let's go over them before getting into more advanced strategies. For example, it's important to limit stimulants like caffeine and nicotine right before bed. And remember that chocolate has caffeine in it. Limit alcohol before bed. Alcohol might make you sleepy, but as soon as your body processes it, you will wake up again and waking up in the middle of the night is exactly what we are trying to avoid. Limit noise and light and make sure that you have a comfortable mattress and a nice room temperature. Look for some solutions if your bed partner snores or moves around too much when you're trying to sleep. If you snore or if your bed partner tells you that you snore, talk to your doctor about getting assessed for sleep apnea. Untreated sleep apnea is hard on your brain and your heart. Finally, Exercise is great, but don't exercise right before bed. In the same way that having a coffee will pump you up and prevent you from sleeping, exercising late in the evening can make it hard to fall asleep. Scientists have been trying to understand what happens when we sleep for a long time. However, it has proven a difficult thing to do. What we have learned is that there appears to be more than one stage of sleep. Although early research on sleep identified five stages of sleep, including stages one through four, followed by a stage of sleep called rapid eye movement or REM sleep. Scientists now typically lump stages three and four into one category, meaning that there are four stages in total. 
Either way, we go through these stages in 90-minute cycles. Our brains behave differently in each stage of sleep. For example, when we are awake, our brain activity looks like this when measured with electrodes on our scalp. Our brains are hard at work and the waves are moving quickly. When we enter stage one of sleep, our waves begin to slow down a little, getting a little bit higher in amplitude as we begin to shift into sleep. This continues into stage two. However, by stages three and four, we begin to experience what is called slow wave sleep. Slow wave sleep is good for our bodies as it is during this stage that our bodies focus on healing, repairing, and storing energy. We spend a lot of time in slow wave sleep, especially early on in the night. At the end of each sleep cycle, we experience REM sleep. It is in REM sleep that we do most of our dreaming, and this stage is especially important for replenishing our memory, attention span, and ability to focus. Without it, we awaken feeling groggy or fuzzy. In this graph, slow wave sleep appears in green and REM sleep is shown in blue. Every 90 minutes, we go through stages 1 through 4 and then back through 3, 2, and 1, eventually ending our sleep cycle with a period of REM sleep. After experiencing REM sleep, we actually experience a brief period of very light sleep in which we are awake or in the very early stages of sleep. Normally, if we have a good night, we fall right back asleep and don't remember these brief periods when we wake up in the morning. However, for those with insomnia, it is usually during these periods, after each sleep cycle, in which people awaken and then find it difficult to fall back to sleep. Our sleep is governed by two biological rhythms. Our circadian rhythm controls the release of hormones related to sleep and wakefulness. It is moderated by sunlight and darkness and typically is a 24-hour cycle. The other rhythm that affects our sleep is our homeostatic rhythm, which is our need for sleep, just like our need for food or water. In the morning, when sunlight hits photoreceptors in our eyes, our brains begin producing chemicals that make us feel alert and ready for the day. In the evening, when the sun goes down, our brain begins producing a hormone called melatonin, which makes us feel drowsy and helps us fall asleep. As we sleep, our brain processes melatonin and levels decrease again, preparing us to go through this cycle again the next day. Our homeostatic rhythm works independently of this, and for people who are sleeping normally, these two rhythms are in sync. When these cycles are not in sync, however, we end up feeling alert when we should be feeling sleepy. This leads to insomnia by making it more difficult for us to fall asleep, making it hard for us to stay asleep, or by waking us up too early in the morning before we've had a chance to feel fully rested. Insomnia is typically treated one of two ways, either with medications like Zopiclone or by cognitive behavioral therapy, which is known as CBT. CBT for insomnia consists of four different parts, stimulus control therapy, sleep restriction, cognitive therapy, and relaxation techniques. CBT for insomnia has proven to help people fall to sleep faster, experience better sleep quality, and to experience small to moderate improvements in total sleep time per night. CBT for insomnia helps about 70 to 80 percent of patients, and it is superior to medication because patients learn new skills and develop new habits, meaning that their benefits continue long term. The first part of CBT for insomnia is called stimulus control therapy. The main principle of this part of the therapy is that if you're in bed all night and not sleeping, you will associate the bed with wakefulness. For example, take a look at this picture. Do you notice anything going on in your body? Some people notice that they feel their stomach growl or that they feel hungry. What about this picture? Feel like having a drink? I won't tell. What this means is that our bodies are constantly paying attention to our surroundings preparing us for things like eating a steak, drinking a beer, or going to sleep. Therefore, if you spend most of your night tossing and turning in bed, you'll begin to associate the bed as a place where you are awake and worrying rather than sleeping. To combat this, try using the bed for sleep or sex. Don't go to bed until you're drowsy enough to fall right asleep. If you're not asleep within 15 minutes, get up out of bed and go somewhere else, such as on a couch or a comfortable chair, and do something relaxing like reading something light or watching TV. What you should avoid if you're having trouble sleeping is reading or watching TV in bed. Some people use reading in bed as a way to become drowsy. That's fine if that works for you, but if you have insomnia, 
We recommend reading on the couch instead. Your sleep will thank us. The next part of CBT for insomnia is sleep restriction. Although it may seem counterintuitive, sometimes in order to sleep better, you may need to first stay up later than you're used to. This slide should help explain what I mean. This graph shows what a normal night's sleep might look like for someone. In this example, the person falls asleep shortly after midnight and wakes up around 6 a.m. For someone with insomnia, a person's sleep might look like this. Here, the person awakens after just one sleep cycle and is unable to fall back to sleep until 4 a.m. By pushing their bedtime back and keeping their rise time the same, we are able to force a person's sleep back into one chunk. This is important because it causes the number of awakenings to decrease. We can then gradually set a person's bedtime earlier and earlier and earlier, extending how much sleep they get. What this means is that, again, you should not go to bed until drowsy. And secondly, no tossing and turning. Set a bedtime for yourself that is late enough that you don't have wasted time in bed. The point is to sleep in bed, not to toss and turn. Find time in your evening for relaxing activities. These should be fun so that you will want to continue doing them, and they should leave you feeling relaxed so that you have an easier time falling to sleep afterwards. Try things like practicing mindfulness, coloring in a coloring book, or doing some deep breathing. Do these during the hour before you sleep, and make sure that you have all your evening chores, like brushing your teeth, finished beforehand. That way you can go straight to bed afterwards. Often, when we lie down, our minds fill up with worries and we experience racing thoughts. When these occur, we are less likely to be able to fall asleep because the anxiety that these thoughts cause make our bodies feel more alert and distressed. One helpful thing that you can do with your racing, worrying thoughts is to take them to another room. On this slide, you can see three columns. A worry column, a column that says what will you do, and a column that says when you will do it. Here's an example of how you fill this out. Let's say you're worried about groceries. First you would write that down, then you would go to the next column and write down what you're going to do about it. In this case, you would write down which groceries you need. Then in the final column, you would write down when you're going to get them. Here in this example, the person writes down Thursday after work. This is the most important column because it allows us to put these thoughts out of our minds. If we don't have a plan in place for something, and a deadline for when we will do it, we will continue to worry. That's what worrying is for. This exercise works for bigger problems too. Let's say you're having an argument with your brother. Using this chart, you would write that down in the first column, and then in the second column, you would write down what it is you're going to do about it to try and fix this problem. For example, you might call him, so when are you going to do that? In this example, the person writes down that they're going to call their brother on Saturday at 1 p.m. When you have all of your worries down on paper, you can go back to bed. Try doing this preemptively, earlier in the night, to try and prevent racing thoughts from coming in the first place. We're going to end now with a list of tips summarizing what we've learned. First, get up at the same early time each day, even on weekends, in order to get your sleep rhythms in sync. Avoid napping, especially in the evenings, as this can make it hard to sleep later at your usual bedtime. However, it's normal to nap more often when recovering from a cardiac event, so you may feel that you need to nap. If you do, we recommend that you nap between noon and 2 p.m. Remember that exercise is great for your mind and body, but not right before bed. If you exercise too late in the evening, you will feel too alert to be able to fall asleep easily. Set up your bedroom so that it is comfortable. Limit alcohol before bed. It may make you feel sleepy, but it will also lead you to wake up later in the middle of the night. Limit stimulants like caffeine and nicotine before bed. Create a bedtime routine and make it one that includes time for relaxing activities like reading or coloring or practicing mindfulness. Remember to only go to sleep when feeling drowsy. The purpose of this is to prevent tossing and turning which causes us emotional stress and tends to feed our insomnia. Also, try to use the bed only for sleeping or sex. If you can't fall asleep within 15 minutes or so, get up out of bed and go find a relaxing place to sit.
like a chair or a couch, and do something relaxing. If you are worrying about something, try writing out your worries as we showed in this video. When you're feeling drowsy enough again, go back to sleep and if you can't sleep within 15 minutes again, repeat as necessary. Try out these tips if you're having trouble sleeping and tell your doctor if you're not sleeping well. Here are some resources for you to check out on your own. Dr. Judith Davidson, a clinical psychologist in Kingston, Ontario, has written an excellent guide to cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia called Sink Into Sleep. You can also check out the Canadian Sleep Society website for brochures on insomnia or obstructive sleep apnea. Thanks very much for watching this video and I hope that it improves your sleep.